Hello. Today's message from Calvary and Lake Havasu is part of our Message to a Messed Up Church series based on the book of 1 Corinthians. Today's message is focused on chapters 4, verses 1 through 21. As always, you can find the Life Notes on our website, calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. Father, we praise you for the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, who gave himself to rescue us. And it's at the name of Jesus that we are set free from sin and death and hell. It is at the name of Jesus that we uh, overcome our addictions, our habits of self-destruction. It is at the name of Jesus that we find freedom and joy and peace. And it is at the name of Jesus that heaven opens up for us and promises us a place for our future. So God, today, uh, we just want to praise you for your son and for his sacrifice for our lives and admit, just confess that, yes, even though we know the name of Jesus, even though he is our Savior, sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes uh, the voice of our fear overcomes us and causes us to run, to hide, to give up. And, And today we want your victory in our lives. We want to hear your voice We want to listen to your truth. We want to yield to your spirit. And we want to follow you better than we ever have before. So meet us in this place. Just let your spirit move in this room. Let it move through the the homes that are joining us online. And may we hear your voice today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4 is our text today, and if you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're in the room, turn to page 1133, and you will find 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That's 1133. As always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It's our gift to you. We'd love for you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just message us. We'll uh, be glad to get you a Bible. Uh, Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, it is great to be with you today. I just got back from a trip to Greece. Jesse and I went to Greece and Bulgaria. Got back Friday. Uh, I just want you to know I'm jet lagged uh, and feeling every bit of it. If you've ever done that, uh, you know uh, what I'm feeling. Somebody said, uh, as I was describing it, they said, wow, that sounds like a hangover. I go, I wouldn't know, but okay, I'll take your word for it. (laughs) So anyway, uh, but hey, let me just tell you a little bit about the trip. Uh, it, was, it was really cool. We went there to encourage churches, do some teaching, uh, sharing. But the, for me, the highlight of the trip was our, our just short trip into Bulgaria. Uh, about 12 years ago, we began partnering with this uh, church plant in Bulgaria. First time I visited there, they were meeting in a home, had about 40 people crammed into a living room. And uh, about that time, we were also starting to build this building where our plans were up for Sweetwater. And we said, hey, if we're going to raise money for us to build a a new church, let's build churches around the world. And so during that time, we uh, helped finish a church in Albania. We built a church down the border in Mexico. And uh, and then we provided most of the funds for this trip. So we got a picture of us there in the church in Sandansky, uh, Bulgaria. And we're, it's Jesse and I, we're praying for the pastor and his family, uh, and, and we're blessing them with some uh, money to finish off the church. There's, it's done, they're using it, but there's some parts that are not safe, and so uh, we're trying to help them finish that up. But pray for the churches in Bulgaria. It, you know, they're in a country that for generations was communist, uh, and, and they're just up against a lot of unbelief, uh, and, and so uh, they're doing a great job. This guy pastors two churches of about 30 miles apart and is back and forth uh, to those and doing what he can for literally pennies. So uh, we got a chance to bless him. And thank you for your generosity in building churches all over the world so the gospel gospel can be shared. So uh, I'm excited about that. But I'm excited to be home because, you know, I've traveled all over the world. I've been lots of places. They're cool. They're great to visit. But can I just say there's no place like the United States of America? And, uh, and I am delighted to be home. And, of course, uh, Independence Day is two days away. So a little early happy Independence Day. Uh, but uh, let me just say this. Uh, there is no country in the world uh, with all of our flaws, with look, and, and all of us know the United States of America is not the country that we would like it to be. Amen? 
Uh, I mean, but e even given that, even given all the stuff that, that needs to happen uh, in our country, at the same time, there is no country in the world that has more freedom and more opportunities than the, than the USA. So I thank God that uh, I get to be a part of this country, and I thank God that we get to celebrate. So I hope you have a great, safe holiday weekend, and glad you're here this morning. Hey, have you ever heard someone say, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? You heard that, right? Uh, don't tell that to businesses being uh, undersold by copycats or ripped off by knockoffs. Because you can go to China and buy a coach purse for 20 bucks. Uh, but, the, but the imitation, the urge to, or tendency to imitate people that we respect is powerful. I mean, it's powerful. All, all of us have been influenced at some point by somebody we looked at and said, wow, I want to be like them. I want to dress like them. I want to think like them. I want to do the things they're doing. And, uh, and we see it in the cultural shifts in clothing, in music, in hairstyles, and in values. Entertainers want to tell us how to vote. Politicians want to tell us how to think. Sports stars influence who, uh, what we buy and how we dress. And, and that's just uh, part of life. Maybe you haven't thought about it, but as I was writing this sermon, I was like, oh man, I remember back in the, the ancient days of the 70s. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay? And, and, uh, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and confess, and some of you can share this, but in the 70s, uh, <laughs> men wore short shorts and long tube socks. Guys, are you with me? Come on, go ahead and confess. Yeah. Look, I'm not proud of these, but where's Waldo, right? Uh, so anyway, and then in the mid-1980s, there was the, this guy that came along playing basketball named Michael Jordan. And up to that point, if you watch any of the old clips of NBA games, the guys had on short shorts and long tube socks. And but Michael Jordan dressed differently. He wore baggy long shorts and socks down around his ankles. And as he became a star, it was like overnight uh, the culture and clothing shifted. And in, by mid 1980s, nobody was wearing short shorts anymore. Nobody was wearing tube socks up to their ankles or up to their knees. And uh, and we pray that they, that style never comes back. Right? <laughs> right? Hey, look, right now, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're noticing, but the trend 40 years later is starting to shift the other way, and I don't like that. So uh, in a world that is filled with social media influencers, celebrities, gurus, life coaches, who are you trying to imitate? Uh, I really, uh, not asking that question in passing or to set up the rest of the message, it's tied into it, but I really want you to wrestle with that. Who is the influence on your life? Who are you trying to look like, act like, be like, uh, achieve like in your life? Because the Apostle Paul has a suggestion. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want us to start off, start off looking at verse 14 through 16. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. The Apostle Paul has the audacity and the authority to challenge us to imitate him as he follows Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then this is something that is written in throughout Scripture. Paul, not only here, but in 1 Thessalonians, he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In Ephesians, he says, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. And Jesus in John 13 said, I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done. This is built in. If you're a follower of Jesus, then we're called to imitate Jesus, our Savior. 
And Paul is saying to the Corinthian Christians, look, you can't see Jesus, so imitate me because you know me and you can see me as I imitate Jesus. So what does Paul want us to imitate in his life? Well, chapter 4 gives four directives where Paul is saying, I want you to imitate me uh, as I imitate Jesus in these ways. So we're going to break this down. We're going to look at this uh, in the light of that whole question of who are you trying to imitate. First of all, Paul challenges us to imitate him as a servant. Imitate Paul as a servant. Verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. He says, I want to be a faithful servant of Jesus. That's who I am. He declares his identity as a servant of Jesus. Now, if we're clear on our identity, it simplifies our life focus. Let me just say that again. If you know who you are and what you're all about, it makes life a whole lot simpler. When you are confused about your identity, it complicates life and it invites pain into your life. Uh, right now, as a nation, we're experiencing the pain and complication of the trend of gender confusion. Now, this is a slow-motion tragedy for many people. But it, it's not only them. There are people who are confused about their identities and connecting their identities to all kinds of things that lead to pain and destruction. For instance, there's people who connect their identities to their jobs and their careers. And maybe you've known some people who, you know, they were all about the job, and when they retired, they just stopped living. Some of them physically died shortly after, and some just stopped being the person that you knew them to be. They lost their identity when they retired. There are people who attach their identities to their possessions. It's like, hey, look at my house, and look what I'm doing in my house. Look at my cars, look at my toys, look at my boat, look at my RV, look at all my stuff. And they want you to see their stuff because that's what their identity is wrapped up in. There are people who, who attach their identities to their abilities, things they can do, accomplishments they have made, their sexuality, their race, their nationality. Even a patriot can be an identity. And all of those identities lead to pain and destruction. The only identity that leads to clarity and peace is knowing that you are a servant of Jesus. Knowing that you're a servant of Jesus gives you that clarity and that peace. So, are you a servant of Jesus? Yes. Have you experienced a life-changing relationship with the Son of God and Savior of the world? Yes. Have you surrendered to God and embraced the identity of a servant? Yes. Yeah, so it's a lot harder to say yes enthusiastically as those questions go. <laughs> See... You know, most of us in this room have already said, yes, we want Jesus to save us. We've confessed Jesus as Lord. We've, we've asked him to forgive us of our sins and give us eternal life. Okay, we, we got that part. But saying, have you surrendered to God and embraced the identity of a servant is challenging to us. That identity piece. Jesus identified as a servant. Do you know when he uh, said, oh, I set this example for you that you should follow my example? He, he did it at the Last Supper when he washed the disciples' feet. His identity was a servant. In Matthew, he's recorded as saying, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I am a servant. The apostles identified as servants of Christ. You heard the apostle Paul. All of them did. Do you identify as a servant of Christ? Jesus. Today, is that your identity? And when I ask that, I'm not just saying, yeah, kind of in a general sense, but is that your primary identity? Is your identity, your, your core of your being, that I am a servant of the living God, that I'm a servant of Jesus Christ? Um, Paul says, if we're a servant, we've got to be found faithful, which means that our servant identity takes precedence over every other identity that we attach. Amen. Okay, now this is hard, so I'm going to just use myself as an example. I am a servant of Jesus who pastors Calvary. I am not a pastor of Calvary who serves Jesus. I, I am a, a servant of Jesus who is a husband I'm not a husband who happens to serve Jesus. 
I'm a father and a grandfather, uh, excuse me, I'm a servant of Jesus who is a father and a grandfather, not a father and a grandfather who happens to serve Jesus. I'm a servant of Jesus who happens to be an American. I am not first and foremost an American who serves Jesus. Do you guys see the difference? You recognize it because this is crucial. If we don't get this, then we will, uh, you know, be followers of Jesus in a very poor, unfaithful way as his servants because our identity, first and foremost, will be something else. And that will lead us to pain and destruction. And we're wondering why is our life askew? Why is our life out of whack? Why does it not make sense? It's because we attach our identity to something else first and then ask Jesus to bless it. Instead of saying, Jesus, I am yours and I'm your servant. And, that, and if you're a servant first and it affects all of your relationships, it affects all of your work, it affects all of your plans, and, and you're going to live in the blessings of God as that servant of Jesus. And the truth is we've got to get this one right if we're going to do any of the other things that Paul says to do. When we align our identity with Jesus, then we can imitate Paul and the rest of his challenges. So imitate Paul as a servant of Jesus and imitate Paul's humility. Verses three through seven, he just continue reading. He says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. For I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Paul says, as a servant of Jesus, I answer to Jesus. As a servant of Jesus, I answer to Jesus, so I'm not really concerned with what you think about me. Now, it sounds a little bit arrogant, but it really isn't. Because what he's saying is, if you're living for the approval and applause of people, you're not serving Jesus. Let me say that again for the people pleasers in the room. <laughs> if you live for the approval and applause of others, you're not serving Jesus. You've got that identity wrong. And, and he says, look, I, I'm not going to judge myself even because I'll lie uh, to myself about myself. So Paul declares, look, God's going to judge me and hold me accountable. So I don't think highly of myself. If you read the Apostle Paul throughout the New Testament, he, he is, he's like, no, I'm the worst sinner of all. I'm the one who's a mess. I, you know, it's only by God's grace that I'm here. He gets that. He says, I don't think highly of myself because that's pride. Look, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of um, self-righteous, arrogant Christians who think highly of themselves and they can be condescending and pompous and holier than thou. And it pushes people away from Jesus. Paul also says, I don't judge other people because that's also pride. Um, when we judge others, we assume that we know their motives. And I'm not talking about seeing somebody do a crime and saying, hey, that was wrong. We're talking about when you Get a text from somebody and you interpret it rather than read it. I know why they said that. Do you really know why they said that? No, but you think you do, right? I know what they meant to do. I know why you did that. We make these statements and they are statements of judgment of people's motives, of people's hearts. And yet Paul says, God's gonna be the one who brings everything to light the hidden things, even the purposes of the heart. In other words, when you judge other people's motives, whose job are you trying to do? 
Yeah, you're playing God when you judge other people's motives. So the next time you catch yourself saying, I know why, you just need to stop and repent right there. Because you're wrong, even if you're right. Because you're trying to play God. You're going to fail at that because you're not cut out for the job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but then here's the other thing about that. And this is, this is the part that, that ought to just kind of slap us upside the face. Paul says God's going to bring everything to light. Okay, first of all, that means nobody gets away with anything. People who think they're getting away with stuff, they're not getting away with it. They're going to give an account to God. And some of you are like mad because you want justice right now. But if you don't get justice right now, guess what? Nobody's getting away with it. They're going to give an account to God. And he's going to bring everything to light and he's going to judge the purposes of our hearts. He's going to judge our motives, which means you need to stop worrying about other people's motives and start worrying about your own. Right? Because I don't know about you guys, but my heart is evil. Okay, I mean, if you are half as bad as I am, you are sick people. <laughs> need to repent. Look, we're going to give an account to God, so we need to, to like, just go, all right, God, I, need, I don't need to judge them. I need to worry about me and start repenting now of our own um, evil motives. And Paul says we should be humble, not only because of that, but because God blessed you. Amen. Verse 7, did you, did you catch this? He says, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it, but you earned it? Um, God blessed you, so don't boast about what you've been given like you earned it. Recognize who you are and the grace of God that abounds to you. Look, I, I say it all the time. I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner. All right, it's just my way of saying I'm not going to forget who I am and the fact that the only reason that I've got any standing whatsoever is the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah. That is it. And if we ever get very far from that, then we're in trouble. And, and, and Paul says, look, uh, you are who you are by the grace of God. You didn't earn it. It was gifted to you. By the way, that scum-sucking pig center line, I stole part of it from the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 13. The end of verse 13, he says, we have become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. So I'll credit him for at least part of it. He talks about pigs other places. So now here's the thing. Uh, it's grace. We're in the kingdom of God because of grace. Not because we're good people, not because we've earned it, not because we worked for it, just the grace of God. It is a gift that you received. If you haven't received the gift, we would love to talk to you about receiving the gift today. Our prayer team will be here at the front. Pastors will be available after the service. That if, if you don't know what we're talking about in terms of grace and about a gift of salvation, then please talk to us or at least fill out a connect card so we can follow up with you. But here's the deal. If you received a gift, you didn't do anything to earn it, so why are you boasting about it? Yeah. It's kind of like bragging about being an American. It is awesome to be an American, but not one of us chose to be born here. Did you choose where you're born? Did you choose who your parents were? No, some of you are like, that wasn't a gift. That was a you know, punishment. <laughs> um, look, it, it doesn't matter, but you didn't choose. You just happened to win the lottery of history because you are living in the U.S. right now. Okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying that's a gift. So you don't, don't brag about it. Just accept it. Look, we were created by God, gifted by God, saved by the grace of God. God is redeeming our lives and God is preparing a place for us so that when this world ends for us or in total, we have a place with Jesus. Amen. That's the gift of grace. So be humble, be grateful, and God's gonna bless you. So imitate Paul as a servant, imitate Paul in humility, and imitate Paul's character. Uh, skip down to verse 11. He says, To the present hour, we, as apostles, hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still, and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Paul says, look, um, we work hard. 
When we're verbally assaulted, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When, we're sl when we are slandered, we answer kindly. And what he's saying is these are the characteristics of Jesus. This is what Jesus looks like. If you've been around Calvary any length of time, you've heard us say, we believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. That's why we want you to go out there and actually be nice people. Be patient and kind because that's what love looks like. And treat people with respect and with honor. And even when they don't treat you that way, still continue to represent Jesus. That's where our power comes from. So let me just ask you, how do you respond when things go wrong? When your plans fall apart, when they blow up, when everything gets bad, do you get angry? Do you get afraid? Or do you trust God who redeems us? How do you re react when people verbally attack you and slander you? Slander means it's not true. Okay, if, you, if they attack you verbally because you did something wrong, that's different. But when they say false stuff about you, uh, I know it makes your blood boil, and I know that you get angry, uh, but how do you respond? Do you attack them back? Do you defend yourself? Or do you simply decide to bless them? And how do you respond and treat people who are rude and demanding? With rudeness or with kindness? Romans chapter 12, actually Romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 21 is a great passage to read. I'll encourage you all to go home and read it because Paul's talking about the characteristics of what it looks like to have the character of Christ. He sums it up in Galatians 5 with the fruit of the Spirit, but here in Romans 12 he breaks it down. Verse 14, one of my favorite verses, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Wow. Wow. That's a challenge to do. But see, that's a, the Jesus way. This is what it means to imitate Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying when he says, hey, look, I want you to be like me. I want you to imitate my character. So imitate Paul as a servant. Imitate Paul's humility. Imitate Paul's character. And then imitate Paul's actions. Verse 20. He says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. The kingdom of God does not consist of talk, but in power. Look, talk is cheap. Especially these days when everyone has a platform and a microphone or at least a YouTube channel. Right? But it's not just the secular world. It's the Christian world too. Christians talk a good game as well. And there is no shortage of Christian people who will tell you what to believe and how your doctrine is all wrong. There is no shortage of Christians who will tell you what company to boycott, what person to vote for, and what products to buy. Have, have you, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I've noticed a trend. It, you would be reading about some Christian you know, author or Christian thing, and at the end of it, they want to sell you something. <laughs> right? I'm like, yeah, okay, so it, that kind of cheapens what you're saying to me, doesn't it? So uh, talk is cheap. And in Corinth, there were these big talkers and they were slandering the Apostle Paul and saying all kinds of things about him. And Paul is basically, he's saying, guys, I'm going to show up there and we'll see who has power. I'm going to show up and we're going to see who uh, really has the power of God because Paul says the kingdom of God doesn't consist in talk but in power. We're talking about the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives, the power of the Holy Spirit to set you free, to break addictions, to restore relationships, to equip you for ministry and to use you for his kingdom. That's the power of God. See, I grew up in a, a world where there was a lot of Bible talk but not much Bible power. I don't know if you shared that background or not, but I went to churches where everybody was encouraged to learn the Bible. We did Bible drills. Anybody do Bible drills? Yeah, it's a pressure-packed thing for eight-year-olds to try to find the, the book in the Bible first. We, you know, and then they, they, people wanted to learn more, and you'd get, you know, uh, these certificates for completion if you learned, you know, took more classes and learned more stuff about the Bible. And I was surrounded by people who could win at Bible trivia and who could tell you all about the dimensions of the tabernacle and other minutiae stuff uh, in, in Scripture. And, and, but here's the thing. There was a lot of talk. There was a lot of knowledge. There was not much power. So here at Calvary, we want you to read... God's word, 
but there's something else that goes with it. We want you to read and apply God's word because if you do that, God will change your life. We're not really all that impressed by how much you know. We're impressed by what you do. I, I, I want you to know scripture. I, I think you guys get that. I love the word of God. I, it's changed my life. I want you to know the Bible. I want you to read the Bible. I want you to study the Bible. But I want you to obey it. Not just learn it, but obey it. Do what it says. Uh, See, I'll take the evidence of God's power over a person's proclamation any day. I want to know, has God changed your life? When I talk with people, I want to know, has God changed your life? And if they say yes, then I want to know, how has God changed your life? Yes, I'm annoying that way. <laughs> and, if, and if you can't really quantify how God's changed your life, you can't say, well, it's if you're just kind of vague about it, then I'm going to go back to the first question. Has God <laughs> changed your life? And then if God has changed your life and you can verbalize that, then I'm going to ask, how is God using your life to lead others to that life-changing relationship with Jesus? How is God using you to bless people in Jesus' name? Because they all go together. Because once you've experienced the grace of God and you, and you know what forgiveness looks like, then, then you can describe how God has changed you and you want to be used by God to help other people discover that freedom in Jesus. So I want to see evidence of life change. That's why we celebrate redeemed lives here at Calvary. It's evidence of the power of God. It's proof of the kingdom of God in our midst. So imitate Paul. As a servant of Jesus, humbly living out the character of Christ in his power. If you do this, here's the cool part. Others will imitate you as you imitate Jesus. It's really powerful for parents and friends and family. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that challenges us at every point of our lives. God, we just confess today that a lot of times we attach our identities to the wrong things and we want to repent. We want to first and foremost be servants of Jesus. God, you know our, our pride, you know our lack of character, and again, we repent. We ask that you would teach us to be like Jesus. Lord, we don't want to live powerless lives. Uh, we don't just want to be a bunch of words. We want to be deeds. We want to see your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives and in our midst, in this place as it is in heaven. So help us to surrender more of ourselves to your Holy Spirit, who is the source of the power in our lives. Set us free so that we can live for you, so that you can use us and this congregation uh, to make a difference in Lake Havasu and Parker and to the ends of the earth. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're often tempted to imitate others in our culture, whether they be good role models or bad. We should, however, make it a habit to imitate the behavior of Jesus Christ, and the way we learn how He behaved is found in Scripture. Like we're known to stay here, if you read and apply God's Word, He will change your life. Over the next several weeks, we'll be hosting a series of online virtual meetups to get to know you and for you to get to know us. I want to invite you to join us, and you can learn more by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash events and clicking on the graphic for the community connection. I hope you will. And I hope that today's message inspired you to be more Christ-like in your daily words and actions and that you will choose to be a blessing to others despite how they treat you. That's all for today. God bless you. Bye-bye.